My Last Duchess comes into the Power and Conflict anthology, but it's power of one human being over another, a husband over an ex-wife. And it's by Robert Browning, who kind of loved all things Italian. And it starts off with the word Ferrara, which you might not know, but it kind of means like, I think it's the, the Duke, the Duke of Ferrara or Duke Ferrara. Okay, who was somebody who was known in in history. And it's like a kind of monologue or half of a dialogue when <laughs> when you're it's being spoken by this Ferrara and he's looking over at a painting on the wall and he's talking about it to somebody and we'll find out who that is in a moment. So let me just read it to you and see if you can run through the that technique of TV flirts that we've talked about before. Think of the theme of it. OK, the only theme we know so far is it's called My Last Duchess. And we know that that's the name of a painting. That's that's obvious from the first line. And. Uh, so listen to the theme, listen to the voice. So we've already said that it's the voice, it's in the eye. So this is this Duke talking about his wife. And now you have to figure out the other things. What's the form of it? Okay, well, you can see straight away, it's got rhyming couplets, wall, call, hand, stands. So, and it's one long piece together. OK, so as we go through, now pay attention to the language devices, images, what kind of stuff is coming up and see what you notice. OK, so Ferrara is talking. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day and there she stands. Will please you sit and look at her? I said Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I've drawn for you but I, and seem as if they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there. So, not the first are you to turn and ask thus, sir, t'was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the duchess's cheek perhaps fra pandolf chanced to say her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat such stuff was courtesy she thought and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy she had a heart how shall i say too soon made glad too easily impressed. She liked whate'er she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Cert was all one, my favour at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherries, summer fishes full broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with round the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such a one and say, just this or that in you disgusts me. Here you miss or here their extent exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth, and made some made excuse, e'en then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? This grew, I gave commands. Then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will please you rise? We'll meet the company below then. I repeat, the Count, your master's known munificence, is ample warrants that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go down together, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. 
Okay, so the poem seems very old fashioned language and difficult at first, but it has a very simple picture that's being painted for us. This guy, Duke Ferrara, is talking about this painting of his wife who has died and he's talking about it to the count your master so the guy who he's talking to is a servant of the count some some count and he's talking about marrying this girl so so he's said goodbye to one wife and now he's planning on marrying a new wife the daughter of a count and on in the process of that he just talks a little bit about his ex-wife and so it's like it's you know that word objectification he's like objectifying as if men objectify women and it's like the duchess is a possession of his and he's sort of proud of her or, or he's proud of the painting and he, i call that peace or wonder now then he names this artist and it doesn't matter if we know or don't know the artist he obviously he does or he thinks it's a big deal to be painted by fra pandolf and the real question here is the question of his power over his wife and i hope you can see that there's there's some sort of abuse going on here so, so he the first part of it is seeing her as an object seeing her as a painting on the wall seeing her like he's proud of her beauty but what's gone wrong what's 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 wrong well in a word it looks like she he's upset he's like he's still upset that his wife was so nice <laughs> it's like he's he, he looks at the wonder of this painting and he sees an earnest glance he sees something on it a spot of joy on her face it's like she blushed or something like that and he said it was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the duchess's cheek Perhaps the artist made some little comment about her. I can never get that faint half flush that dies along her throat. It's so delicate, that blush on her face. And she blushes. So the suggestion is that he thinks she's flirting with the artist. Or, and this is the deeper point, he is just completely jealous of any attention that she pays to another man. And here is his first criticism. She had a heart too soon made glad. Now, you might say that that is sounds kind of nice. She was. She was pleasant. She was obliging. She was giving to other people. It need not mean that she was flirtatious or or anything worse that's why I say she was just nice. There's there's no evidence to say anything else. There's evidence to say he was jealous. There isn't evidence to say that she was a, a, a bad woman or, you know, flirtatious woman. But it says, it says she liked what air she looked on. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? So it's not that she was fed up with her husband and looking elsewhere. She was just genuinely in love with life. And it says her looks went everywhere. He said, sir, it was all. And it's like, it's everywhere. Everywhere she looked, she found pleasure in life. And, and he said, my favorite, her breast, you know, like normally when you spoke of a favorite, it could be something like physical object, like say, almost like a necklace or something. Her husband's necklace. He said, well, she wore my necklace there. Very good. But, but she got excited by the sunset the sunset the dropping of the daylight in the west so she was smiling at the sunset or some somebody brought us some cherry blossom or, or cherries maybe and he, he broke the branch and brought it to her 
So, and somebody got her a white mule and she rode round and she just, thank you. She's just pleasant. It doesn't say she was seeking attention. She just gracefully, gratefully received it. But then you've got something else comes up. You've got how this guy thinks about himself. And he says, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anyone's gift. OK, so now you've got the point of his jealousy. He is just insufferably proud about himself and about what he has to offer her. And how dare she just smile at my gift of a 900 year old name? You know, it's like saying we are the Ferraras. We are king of the heap, man. You know, how dare you look down on us? So he was insufferably proud. And he was really down on her for not, not taking his aristocratic background seriously. And he said, who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling, even if you had skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such as one. To say that just this or that in you disgusts me. Here you miss, there you exceed the mark. He's talking about... Uh, of course, I should have made my criticism obvious. You know, it's almost it's almost obvious that he did do that, that he crushed the spirit out of her. If she let herself be lessened so or taught so, or plainly set her wits to yours or made excuse, then there would be some stooping. I choose never to stoop. Now, there you've got the big bit there. He is he if he'd been honest. If he'd allowed her the honesty of his feelings, if he'd been loving enough to allow her to say things back to him, to have a really honest conversation. But he says, I'm an aristocrat. She's just a, she should be grateful that she bears my name. I'm a Ferrara. Now, this poem is drawn from a real event and and it's all real gossip. And the gossip was that the Duke Ferrara had his wife killed. And this is what Robert Browning is drawing the poem from. Now, whether that's the truth or not, uh, I don't know. And in a sense, it doesn't matter because it's not a historical record. It's a poem. And it's not a poem about did he kill her or didn't he? It's a poem about a husband's abuse of his wife and what that looks like but we can see something that happened here okay and he said he just got sick of it whenever i passed her but who passed without without much the same smile she just smiled at everybody she was genuinely pleasant that's that's what you can draw from that it doesn't mean that she was endlessly flirtatious it just means that she was genuinely pleasant to everyone and he just couldn't stand it. And if they happened to be male, he was overcome with jealousy. If they happened to female, he just uh, he just thought it was stupid. If it was a gift of some cherries or a gift of it, it, did, it didn't really matter. It was all going on in his head. And he said, I'm not going to stoop to explain myself to her. And then it says this, which is a rather chilling bit. This grew, this situation developed. I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. So at that point, that is translated as he had her killed, but or she died of a broken heart, or she just died, she just withered, withered. Because I, he's what's being described here very, very cleverly is is that spirit that crushes other spirits, that dominating, manipulative cold blanket on average just sort of just looking down on somebody the whole time and that's the end of the poem in a way because the next bit is what happens next the action there she stands as if alive and so he's looked talking about the painting again and then he moves on there's company downstairs there's a big group of people downstairs and he talks to the the count your master he, he says right well uh, i've made my bid for your master's daughter and i trust that no 
no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. I hope all the business is sorted. Looking forward to marrying uh, your the count, your master's fair daughter's self, as I avowed, is my object. And then his ex-wife, the story about her is over. Let's go down together. And then he just immediately turns to another object, this statue of Neptune taming a seahorse which was cast in bronze by Klaus of Innsbruck. Of course, you know, we don't know who these, these people are, but the implication is it's another famous piece. So he turns from a painting of his wife, which is beautiful, and it picks up the this blush in her face, and just looking at the blush makes him angry and critical all over again. How dare she blush in the painting? It's my painting. I paid for it. It belongs to me. And then he turns from that to think about his new wife, who the implication is just saying fair daughter sounds like this young woman is going to be considerably younger than him. I think that's a fair, fair guess. And he just starts to look at another object of art. So his wife has been reduced to an object of art. It's horrible, isn't it? Horrible. OK, so that's the poem. What you are generally asked to do is to is to untangle it and to decide what's happening within the poem. And they'll give you some uh, question that will lead you into lead, lead you into an analysis of, of feelings. But that's the the gist of it. So let me just show you and I'll send these notes to you. OK, here we go. The poem in a nutshell. In this dramatic monologue, the speaker of the Duke proudly points out a portrait of the Duchess. He was angered by her behavior, which made him jealous. He says she was too friendly towards others. Her flirtatious behavior was disrespectful towards him and his family name. That's the big deal. And he hints that he took steps to have her murdered. And then they walk away from the painting. And we learn that the visitor has come to arrange the Duke's next wedding. Okay. Then some notes about Robert Browning. So he was fascinated by the Renaissance period in Italy, but this was published in 1842, right at the beginning of Queen Victoria's reign. And it's good to get a couple of quotes. Here we go. Yeah. And we've referred to these. That's the opening lines. And we notice the effect of the rhyming couplets. Rhyming couplets are a very tight type of rhyme. And he's using the rhyming couplets to remind you that the Duke is a very tight, a very controlling character. Even the rhyme is controlled. OK, and that's the big point of that. And then this repetition of the of the spot of joy. And a reference he, she blushes twice and it the repetition shows how much it bothers him that she seems to be flirting and it also objectifies her as a woman and shows that he feels she's his possession you know she's not allowed to feel anything about anything else except me 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 okay and then the the quote there the very famous one i gave commands then all smiles stopped together so this it might mean murder or it might not. I personally think that it means the crushing of his wife's spirit. And that's the point that the poet is getting to. And where, in fact, he's, in my opinion, being specifically vague about it and not telling us what happened, except that the smile stopped and now he's after a new wife. OK, and it reinforces the idea that he sees her as a possession rather than the fact that he loves her. There's no indication that he loves her at all. OK, and so the aspects of power that are being picked up here are he craves absolute control and power over everyone and maybe even abuses his power by having his wife killed. So what they do in the anthology is that they get you to do a deep dive into one poem and then compare it with another poem. And the ones they say, pick another poem from your from your anthology and combine it. 
and compare it, compare and contrast it. And you haven't done checking out my history yet, but the one you have done is Ozymandias. And so this is a useful comparison. Compare the fact that the Duke craves power with the dead king's attitudes and desires. I am Ozymandias, king of kings. You know, look on my works and be and, and despair. You know, that bit that's there. Okay. Let's and this cluster here, the peel table, is in a comparison with checking out my history. So I'm going to leave that one until we've done that. Okay. All right. I'll send this on to you.